Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, Vittorio Toscano, the Duke of Portoscuro and the survivor for Chapter 26, Forged in Fog. As I covered when talking about the night, Forged in Fog is a very special historical domain chapter. Because in a similar way to All Kill and Darkness Among Us, the survivor and killer are directly linked in their stories. Each of them has a part to play, big or small, in the story of their counterpart. Jeff's is pretty minor, with Frank paying him for his first commission for a mural in the Legion's hideout, while Yun Jin and Trix's stories are completely intertwined and impossible to fully separate. The survivor and killer for Forge and Fog, Tarosh Kovac and Vittorio Toscano, are kind of in the middle ground between them. Both of them have their own separate stories that cross over at the end. In my ninth video, I had almost nothing bad to say about the backstory we were given for our newest killer. And when I first read Vittorio's backstory, I felt really positive about his as well. But the more I read it, and the more I tried to relate it to the character we'd been given, the more out of place it all felt. Like putting together a jigsaw puzzle and all the pieces are there, but one of them's been cut just a little bit off centre, so the puzzle doesn't fit together like it should. There's a lot going on in Vittorio's lore. There's the surface level story of an Italian nobleman who seeks knowledge and understanding in a world that doesn't accommodate that. There's the wider story of Vittorio leaning on the Black Veil storyline and uncovering the marks they've made in history. And the implication that Vittorio might be an alternate universe version of the Observer who's found his way into the realm of the Entity. This on paper is fantastic. A great follow up on the Observer's disappearance, and another lore survivor just like Hattie. But there's something kind of wrong with Vittorio. And it's videos like this I'm going to have to preface with a gigantic in my opinion. Whenever I'm critical of something that people like, I tend to get accused of preaching what I'm saying like it's a fact. But I just want to reiterate to anyone planning to construe this video in bad faith, this is, like every piece of art criticism ever, based on my opinions and my interpretations of the text. You don't agree, that's completely cool and good, you do you. But I'm here to talk about what I think based on my interpretations. My takes are no more or less objective than yours, because that's how art and me literacy works. Everyone okay with that? Good. Now let's get cracking. Vittorio Toscano was born in 1343 as the third son of a noble family. And while he wasn't liable to inherit, his father still wanted him to train traditional noble behaviour. Combat and warfare was largely still the domain of noble families especially in the time and place Vittorio comes from, but more on that later. However, unlike his brothers, Vittorio refused to take up arms, preferring peaceful solutions to his problems. Nevertheless, the knight Ettore Fabrizio was employed by his father to train him in the art of warfare, but he proved hesitant, refusing to fight from a philosophical standpoint. He saw physical violence as the last resort of the incompetent, and this philosophy is critical to bear in mind reading this story. Vittorio always avoids violence, and every decision he makes in the story is driven by the desire to not cause physical harm, or alleviate it if at all possible. Bear this in mind, it will be very, very relevant to this story. It's crucial to understand that Vittorio's opposition to violence doesn't seem to come from a moral standpoint, but rather an intellectual one. He doesn't necessarily believe fighting is a morally bad thing to do, at least has never stated or implied that but instead that an intellectual solution is always available, and resorting to violence is something that you do only if you're not competent enough to see that intellectual solution. The death of the page he's training with is a prime exhibition of that philosophy in action. Vittorio is more than skilled enough to hold his own in a fight, blocking and parrying his attacks effortlessly, and the page dies, not because Vittorio fought back, but because of his own clumsiness. The page turned violent, and paid for his recklessness with his life and Vittorio renouncing the sword comes across as his point being proven. Since he wasn't going to inherit anyway, Vittorio's father sent him to live with his uncle Renzo, the Duke of Portoscuro and a fellow scholar who never seemed to have taken a wife. Which is medieval speak for a fucking nerd who never goes outside, spends all his time indoors researching and gets no bitches. During his time learning about esoterica with his uncle, Vittorio uncovers a long lineage of individuals with exceptional arcane knowledge people who hail from other worlds and bring humanity an understanding of that which lies beyond. 
people called Observers. There's no indication that the character we know as the Observer is actually one of these people. But nevertheless, Vittorio intends to follow in their footsteps and collect as much arcane knowledge as he can for the betterment of humanity. He and Renzo travelled the world collecting secrets and artefacts, not least of which was a tablet written in Akkadian cuneiform. The pre-biblical language of Babylonia, which happens to be the language the plague wrote and spoke in. But before I go on, I want to do possibly the nerdiest nitpick I've ever done on this channel, and that's saying something. But this Akkadian tablet was probably found in about the 1370s. But Akkadian as a language was long dead by then and wasn't rediscovered by the West till 1767, much less fully translated. The translation of Akkadian cuneiform was actually finalised as late as the 19th century. So I don't know how Vittorio and his uncle managed to translate the Akkadian tablet in front of them a good 500 years prior to the language being fully translated. But this is literally just the ultimate nitpick, and it doesn't affect the quality of the story in any way, it's just something funny I found doing research for this video, so let's just move on. In their search for enlightenment and knowledge that would save the world, Renzo and Vittorio collect artifacts from around Europe that form a key to a hidden sanctum. One that reveals the truth about everyone's favourite Elrich horror murder cult, the Black Veil. Part of the Black Veil's tasks on Earth are to eliminate these observers from the real world whenever they crop up, so their knowledge and wisdom cannot be used against the entity's interests. This is a nice little way to involve the Black Veil without having them actively interfere, they don't even do anything in the story specifically. It's just a pleasant acknowledgement that they exist, and Victoria is kinda cleaning up after their mess. It also suggests that the Observer that we know and love may have been an entity expert on Terra Primus before he even entered the fog, and the Black Veil's intervention in that universe may have been what stuck him in the fog in the first place. But we don't really know that for sure, this is just conjecture. Inside ancient ruins, Vittorio and Renzo learn of the Lapis Paradisus, an artifact of incredible arcane power, capable of opening a door to the extraplanar paradise where the Observers are currently residing. No sooner does Vittorio find out about this, than tragedy befalls his little expedition. Renzo steps on a snake and within minutes his uncle is lying dead on the floor, and Vittorio Toscano inherits as the Duke of Portoscuro, with all his uncle's wealth, titles and resources dedicated to finding the Lapis Paradisus and freeing the observers from their imprisonment. This is where the chapter's killer, the mercenary knight Tarosh Kovac, enters Vittorio's story. And from here on in, the two characters' stories are told in parallel, covering the same events from two different perspectives. Vittorio recruits Tarosh as a bodyguard as he adventures across Europe, searching for the Lapis Paradisus, and eventually they find it in the Portuguese city of Sintra, which is a real medieval city that still exists in Portugal today. When the stone is uncovered, Vittorio insists on a non-violent means of acquiring it. After all, physical violence is the last resort of the incompetent, but for some reason he just fucks off to let Tarot collect it unsupervised. This might seem like a legendarily stupid thing to do, to let this disloyal mercenary off his leash to complete your life's work instead of you, and in all fairness, it is, but it plays into what I think is Vittorio's fatal flaw as a character in a really elegant way, but I'll go into that once we get to the end of the story. As soon as he's left to his own devices, Tarosh immediately contravenes his employer's instructions because he's got better things to be doing now, and seizes the stone before returning to Portoscuro with Vittorio in chains and the secret of the Lapis Paradisus at the front of his mind. Vittorio spends the rest of his days on Earth locked in one of his own cells as Tarosh attempts to squeeze the stone secrets out of him, torturing people of Portoscuro in an attempt to force Vittorio's hand. But all the while, Vittorio was hard at work, using his arcane knowledge to engineer his own escape. Dreaming of freedom from this nightmare world around him, he frantically scribbled sequences and patterns from the Lapis Paradisus onto the walls, until finally, at the end of his rope, he found freedom. Well, he was free of the cell, but far from a free man. And before long, Vittorio probably wished he was back in it. Because it was not paradise he found himself in, at least, not a paradise for him, it was no heaven but the Entity's realm, and Vittorio was now its prisoner, doomed to wander the fog forevermore. Right off the bat, initial reactions, Vittorio's story has a lot of story in it. 
despite its length, it feels like some areas of the story got rushed through towards the end, and it's the rare modern DVD story I'd argue probably should have been longer. The start is easily the best part, painting this picture of Vittorio in a setting of medieval Italy as a very complete person. Some with a personality, principles, relationships, virtues and flaws, exactly what a base story for a survivor should do. By the end, it kind of devolves into a series of Skyrim fetch quests that bog the story down, with DBD's typical self-fellating Black Veil wankery that mostly just comes across as Vittorio collects an item, reads some text in ancient language, and starts looking for the next one. This bloating in the middle results in the end feeling kind of rushed, with Tarash's arrival and most of the story's actual conflict only arriving in the last, I'm going to say, quarter or even fifth of the story. It always feels like an afterthought, especially when you realise that Vittoria rocks up not even halfway through Tarosh's story, and it's not like we'd learn a lot from Vittoria's character that we couldn't learn from Tarosh's story. It's established in that story that Vittoria avoids violent conflict and was an arcane researcher during his life that ran expeditions to recover lost artefacts. The only stuff we learn specifically from Vittorio's story is background details, family names, dates, Black Veil related entity stuff, and admittedly we do get a more complex exploration of Vittorio's principles and their origins. But again, all of that's at the start. Everything else that's new is mostly just fan wankery. That means a lot more to lore nerds like myself who want to learn more about the Black Veil and the entity's impact on the real world, and precisely nothing to anyone else. However, it's important to remember that regardless of how relevant the Black Veil stuff is, it doesn't come at the cost of fleshing Vittorio out. It's more of an added bonus, really, albeit one that does mess with the pacing of the story and makes getting through the middle bit kind of a chore. Even just the start of the story establishes everything we need to know about Vittorio, which makes the shonky pacing pretty forgivable. One thing I'm a huge fan of in Vittorio's story is how he's given a fatal flaw that genuinely enhances the character and remains relevant throughout the story and it actually comes from one of his greatest virtues. Vittorio is a pacifist on an intellectual standpoint. He believes violence is a sign that your brain simply isn't big enough, and that greed and ignorance leads to violent conflict, something that most of his story does not contest. After all, Vittorio's goal isn't to fight to liberate the world, but instead to use his knowledge of the arcane to push humanity forwards. However, when Tarosh enters the equation, the validity of Vittorio's perceptions and principles comes into question. To understand why Vittorio's pacifism is so unusual, we have to look at the time and place he came from. And here comes time for a teensy confession. I was technically wrong when I said Vittorio is from medieval Italy, or at least I wasn't entirely right, because Portoscuro, or at least the town of Portoscuso with a very similar name, is actually in Sardinia. This weird little grungus of an island off the west coast. While a part of Italy these days, Sardinia spent a lot of its time as an independent autonomous zone that was sometimes unified, sometimes split, but always in a state of turmoil, often between colonists from mainland Italy and from Aragon, a region of eastern Spain. This means that Sardinia was even more rife with conflict and bloodshed than mainland Italy, which is bloody saying something but also makes Vittorio's pacifism very controversial for the time. In 14th century Sardinia, war was something distant to us that just happens to other people, halfway across the world like it is here in the UK or the United States today. It was a fact of life, something that just happened, with the borders being redrawn, kings and regimes falling, and entire economic systems being uprooted overnight. An ideological refutation of all physical violence, even self-defence in such a time, would be seen as naive, the behaviour of either a coward who fears battle, or a child who does not understand the way the world works. In times like these, a moral opposition to war existed, less common than it is today but still far from unheard of. But an intellectual argument against violence? That was a whole different kettle of fish. When wars are fought over religious differences, blind racial or national hatred, or because a king or noble thinks he's genuinely entitled to your land because of the nature of his birth, you can't really reason with that. War isn't pretty and it's certainly not right, but in violent times it's inevitable if you want to see the dawn. Vittorio seems to think of himself as being above that, only the incompetent need stoop to physical violence, 
an arrogance and naivete that ultimately cost Vittorio everything. Tarnasha's arrival in the story acts as a wake-up call for the narrative, a short, sharp shock to the system that reminds us that this world is a violent and brutal one, and violence and brutality are often required to make your way through it. Vittorio travels with Tarosh as they search for the Lapis Paradisus until they come to the impasse in Sintra. In his naivete, Vittorio trusts Tarosh to follow through with his instructions to not harm the population of Sintra without needing to be supervised, and Tarosh takes that chance to seize control of the situation, to gain both the Lapis Paradisus and Vittorio's wealth and power for himself. This could have been avoided if Vittorio had been a little bit more cautious and conscious of Tarosh's uncertain loyalties, and willingness to use violence to get what he wants. As I covered in my video on the night, mercenaries in medieval Europe had a reputation for being self-serving and disloyal, so you'd think that would be something that Vittorio would bear in mind. But nope, Vittorio places his trust entirely in Tarosh, and then just leaves him to his own devices, resulting in Tarosh murdering lots and lots of people to get the stone for himself. This clearly refutes Vittorio's philosophy. Yes, what Tarosh did was morally wrong, but it was clearly the smart thing to do and exhibits his competence at his job. It was something Vittorio should have been aware of and it has serious consequences. And his terminal naivete is also exhibited at the very end of the story, where the paradise he fought so hard to enter turns out to be nothing more than a realm of bloodshed and slaughter. Vittorio toyed with forces beyond his comprehension, and put all his faith, money, and even his life in pursuit of it, only to found he'd bitten off way more than he could chew. Vittorio's naivete is a character flaw derived from his greatest strength, and this is fantastic writing. Similar to Yun Jin, another survivor with a fatal flaw that comes from the same place as her personal drive to succeed, Vittorio is exactly what I've been hoping for from a new survivor on paper. So why am I so made on him in practice? Well, the Vittorio present in his story is basically what you'd get if your D&D character has all their points of intelligence but had wisdom as their dump stack. Someone so obsessed with the pursuit of knowledge and dedication to the greater good that he forgets the realities of the world he's living in and pays the price for that. He's a historical domain survivor who fits in with his own time period and feels like an organic part of it, while still being his own thing. This is all the framework for a fantastic character. So it just begs the question, where did that fantastic character go? Let's look at Vittorio as he's presented in the game. His clothes don't really fit a 14th century nobleman. Like, they're not even the same ones he wears in his bio art. It says he found his clothes on Wandering the Fog, but like, why? How come none of the other survivors are wearing clothes they found? Is it because actual authentic clothing from the Middle Ages wouldn't be slay enough to market their newest survivor? And don't even get me started on the haircut. Man's got a fade in the 14th century. Are you serious? I genuinely do not get the point of including a medieval era survivor if he isn't going to look the part. Especially since survivors are mostly just skins anyway. It makes Vittorio's inclusion in the way he is insincere. Like the character we have in his story is totally divorced from the one we have in the game. Hattie got a lot of shit for not being the same Hattie that we had in the Tome stories, but at least the survivor Hattie had a good reason for it. She was explicitly an alternate universe version of the Tome version of Hattie. Vittorio just feels like a massive cop-out, where they wanted to do the all-kill thing and tie the survivor and killer together without actually putting in the work and deviating from the conventionally attractive modern man that is guaranteed to earn him a ton of love and money from fans. Truth be told, it makes him feel cheap. Where's that medieval clothing or hairstyle? There could have been something really interesting going on with his visual appearance, some physical indication that he's not from the same time the other survivors are from. Maybe not a battle wound, given that he was a pacifist, but maybe smallpox scars, since that disease was absolutely rampant at the time, second only to the bubonic plague and other people killed in Europe at the time. If Vittorio is a medieval noble, he should look the part. Not like a poetry lecturer in his early 40s, who you thought was pretty cool until you saw him chatting up freshers at the student union bar. And that's not to mention how poorly his perks reflect his character. Vittorio is all but stated to have spent a large amount of time in the fog, between his taking by the Entity and his time as a survivor, 
which isn't necessarily a canon problem because time flows strangely in the Entity's realm, and he could have spent hundreds of years wandering the fog without his body aging a day. However, Vittorio is established in his perks as a wise and insightful man who is familiar with the secrets of the Entity, with Fog Wise especially evoking that feeling of an experienced veteran of the fog. And yet, none of that personality, none of that experience is ever shown to us in his lore. Yes, he is knowledgeable, but he's also naive, and has no idea about the truth of the Entity's realm before he got dragged in. Unlike, say, Hattie. If that's how the game is going to present him to us, the story should respect that, and present him that way as well. Or at least give us something to work with, to reconcile the Vittorio of the Middle Ages and the Vittorio were given in the fog. As talked about in my night video, Tome 14 will be dedicated to Vittorio and Tarosh. And I said that Tarosh's story has tons of room to dedicate to fleshing out his relationships beyond the confines of his base lore. But for Vittorio, I worry that this tome will be spent playing catch-up, to fill in the gigantic gap between the end of his base lore and his final status as a playable character. That might even be the reason Vittorio and Tarosh are getting stories this early on in the first place. I worry that Vittorio in his current state was the result of compromise. Behaviour acknowledging that a survivor needs to be sexy to sell after Hadi was almost entirely forgotten about after her release. Not by me, mind you, I absolutely love Hadi, but there's no denying she hasn't made much of an impact. The increasingly horny marketing of this whole chapter kind of validates it for me. Vittorio didn't need a fade and jeans to be a compelling character, so why does he have them when they destroy who he was always meant to be? He feels like the result of playing to the common denominator, I think that's kind of hurt his potential as a character, and it'll take a pretty solid tome to bridge that gap in a satisfying way. Maybe we'll get it, maybe we won't. But either way, it should really have been in the base lore, and its absence has soured me on what is by all other accounts a pretty great inclusion to the Survivor roster. He's good, I just believe he could have been a lot better. Until his tone comes out, that's all I really have to say. So that's everything I have to say for now about Vittorio, but what did you reckon? Do you think he's great? Do you think he sucks? Do you think what I think and that he could have been better but that he's kind of okay? Do you just think I'm a prude and that I'm being boring because I don't like obvious thirst traps? And by the way, if you do think I'm a bit of a prude, I recommend go and watch my Hellraiser video where I talk about BDSM and horror for three minutes and then get back to me. Oh, and while you're at it, I know this video had a lot of comparisons between Vittorio and Hadi, and I'm as annoyed as everybody else by the fact that Hadi doesn't get any new cosmetics for a while, but do not make that the developer's problem. I've had reports from devs on the creative team that players have been harassing them because of, of all things, Hadi not getting cosmetics, and that stops right now. I hope I don't have to tell you this, and if I don't, don't take this personally, but seriously, it's the behaviour of a child, and do not stoop to it. On a brighter note, if you like the video, then please do subscribe, it would mean the world to me to have you back for future videos. And while you're down there, you can find links to my socials, including my Twitch, where we play Dead by Daylight and Evil Dead the game. Patrons have gotten to see this video early as well. If you fancy being part of the Early Access Patreon gang, my link is down in the description as well. If you want to support the channel, my gratitude would be immeasurable. I have one video planned for the month, and I'm really hoping I get it done in time, but... Fingers crossed. In any case, I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.